So I'm going to have a whistle stop tour through um, HLA, non HLA antibodies um, after kidney transplantation. Um, and I think challenges are what make life interesting, but actually overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. And I think uh, Doug did an excellent job, but we could have talked about infections for a whole day, and I'm sure we could actually talk about antibody uh, for a whole day, because obviously if we over immunosuppress our patients, increases incidence of infections, and if we under immunosuppress them, then we get increase in antibody production. So let's start off with HLA antibodies. Well, as many of you uh, will have availability in your laboratories, your clinical translational uh, laboratories, we can measure single antigen beads using the uh, Luminex platform. And most places uh, use an MFI, which is the mean fluorescence intensity levels over time. But actually, what is a significant level and do they actually correlate from laboratory to laboratory? And the answer is no, they don't correlate, and actually they do vary. So what one lab says is a cutoff of uh, 500, maybe another lab's 2,000. So we're all aware of the causes of graft dysfunction, and what you can see from uh, this work, which was done by Solaris et al., is that you can see that the antibody-mediated rejection, which is the dark blue line here, kind of starts off with a bit of a peak. It goes down to a lull. Um, around about 100 days, but then increases. So actually, once you've um, reached just over one year post-transplant, the most common reason to have graft dysfunction is antibody-mediated rejection, which is confirmed in a biopsy. So all of you in the room are aware of the reasons for sensitization. So the most common one that uh, we have in practice is either a blood transfusion or a previous transplantation. We've had various strategies over the years, for example, uh, washing the cells, so using leukodepleted blood, but actually going through subsequent washing to remove the antibodies. Um, and also we previously, and sometimes I've actually used calcineurin inhibition, so cyclosporin and more laterally tacrolimus, for about 10 days, repeat the HLA antibody, seeing if you get an antibody response before the patient's been transplanted, and then um, you, can, you can either wean it or reduce it. And we've done that because in the past we have had patients, and we won't mention the urologist because they're out of the room, but they bring them in for an operation like a bladder augment. Um, somebody doesn't realize the hemoglobin's a bit low, your anesthetist gives blood, your patient becomes sensitized, and that wonderful living donor that you had in the wings now gives you a positive cross match. Um, obviously, I put an exclamation mark. We have had a few patients that have become pregnant, and pregnancy is quite a sensitizing event. But don't forget infections and all those lovely immunizations that Doug just talked to us about, because actually you do see um, that you get a transient HLA antibody response, and sometimes that can actually be meaningful in uh, precluding a donor, but it's pretty rare. So obviously we know about doing the cross match, and you can have situations where obviously you expect the cross match to be positive because you know the um, what the HLA antibody is. And many places um, have used baseline flow cytometric cross match or gone to the CDC, so the new complement dependent cytotoxic cross match. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about how important are donor specific antibodies. So the presence does not always actually inform what is going on in the kidney. And that's really what you want to know. Can this be used as a biomarker? Will we use plasma creatinine as a biomarker? We use HLA antibodies as a biomarker, but actually I use EBV viremia as a biomarker to try and gauge how much immunosuppression an individual patient actually needs. And what we know is that many patients can have specific post-transplant donor specific antibodies and will never ever develop antibody-mediated rejection. And we can see these resolution of these antibodies without doing anything. However, chronic antibody-mediated rejection is the leading cause of long-term renal allograft failure. So obviously in pediatrics, this is uh, the collaborative transplant study. This is showing you the changes over the time, showing that we're getting much better at doing transplants, the transplants lasting much longer. But we can actually ascertain that the matching is important. So actually getting a well-matched first graft um, reduces the chance of that um, graft being lost earlier on. 
And that is really an important and why we all strive to get the best matched kidney where we possibly can. This is in a deceased donor, whereas in living donor, the advantage of a living donor, which we've also published, which was a little bit controversial, but we were trying to say that a poorly matched living donor kidney is probably better than a well-matched deceased donor kidney. So within an individual patient, you have potentially the development of these de novo donor specific antibodies. And what we know is, is that it can start giving subclinical rejection. So if you do biopsies in patients that have got normal urine allograft function that already have the presence of donor specific antibodies, you may already have some changes histopathological. And there are very criteria that we can actually use to decide about what the risk is. So actually, when we're talking about the immunosuppression, you may modulate your immunosuppression because of the risk of an individual patient. And I think it's really important to have a low threshold for performing a percutaneous renal transplant biopsy in a patient who's got the presence of donor specific antibodies. Um, Paul Terasaki is our king, or was our king and guru, and he said that antibodies are responsible for all graft losses. I wouldn't quite say all, nothing in medicine is all, but he was just trying to highlight when we understood the humoral theory of transplantation that it was really important. And what this really showed in his initial work was actually the presence of HLA antibodies is a defining moment in an individual patient. Basis is questionable, but when you look at groups of patients, they are a major cause of graft loss. And uh, we know that having HLA antibodies itself may not have much of an impact, but as soon as they become donor specific, as you can see here over time, statistically significantly, a reduction in the graft survival. So if we know that we've got a 40% lower graft survival, and we know that the presence of these antibodies is fairly common in up to about a third, and they tend to appear within the first few years post-transplant, starting around a few months after transplant, because obviously very often people are giving induction agents maximum immunosuppression, it takes a few months. But we know that actually the mismatch is really important. And of course, we check for A, B and D are mismatched, but actually we get a lot of HLA, Q, HLA class 2 antibodies formed against both DP and DQ antibodies. And we know that um, some of the factors of how much of microcirculatory inflammation you have histopathologically is important. So let me give you an example. A 14-year-old young man, he's two years post-living donor, transplant end-stage kidney disease, he's got CACUT, he's on the TWIST protocol, your basiliximab has been given two doses, your prednisolone's been weaned off five days, he's on MMF and TAC, he's got stable trough tacrolimus levels, there's no viremia, his creatinine is pretty stable at 80, and he's got no blood pressure or proteinuria, and then he develops DQ antibodies. So what do you do? Well, I think that in 2023, we're thinking about, are there biomarkers, or do you just actually go for a biopsy? Who would go for a biopsy, even if you had normal renal allograft function? There's no right or wrong answer. Professor Flynn. So we're all going to Seattle. So I'm, Muttley asked me last night not to give him the talks because he says you're probably going to change it overnight. And yes, he was right. So I very quickly put in, because we had this, we had this discussion, but I thought I would just show some of the slides of uh, JJ's uh, work uh, together with Ram, who is in the back of our audience. So thank you, Ram. And what we did is we wanted to, first of all, look at what is the natural history of HLA antibodies. So this was the largest study and the reason started that we had a discussion within the transplant team, and I said, well, why don't we just monitor the HLA antibodies and we're actually not going to do anything about them? And people were saying, well, how can you do that? And I said, well, we don't know what to do. So this was a study where no changes of immunosuppression is made. And I think that's the difference, is, is that nowadays, many people would change what they do because they develop donor-specific antibodies. And then we correlated it. So we looked at 215 um, low-risk uh, immunologically transplanted patients. Um, so 9 out of 10 had a pre-transplant calculated reaction frequency, which was, was low. None of them had um, antibodies at the start, and we had a very small number of retransplants. And what we showed is, is that the proportion of children with HLA antibodies on at least two occasions uh, was about a third had donor-specific antibodies, non-specific HLA, which of course could be post-transplant immunization and post-transplant infections, was about a quarter, 
but just uh, under half had no HLA antibodies. And we looked at the different subtypes, and you can see here that the majority of them were actually DQ antibodies, so class 2. And how many of them actually with, um, could you see that would resolve? Well, the resolution was in about half, 47%. And you can see here, majority of them were the class two antibodies. And again, this was no, no change in immunosuppression. But what we did see is, is that those that had persistent antibodies generally did much worse. And we did a comparison looking to see what was the important and actually the, the, how high the MFI at the time of first detection and how long post-transplant was actually quite predictive of the overall long term. So we actually showed that patients with donor specific antibodies actually had statistically worse renal allograft outcome, as you can see here with a p-value of 0 0.01. When we tried to look to see those that resolved and those that persisted, the graph got a little bit more muddled. So I think actually you need a larger, if we looked at it again with the power calculation, you probably need larger series. And of course, we're not going to get that data now because many people change the immunosuppression. So what we showed is that the donor specific antibodies were detected in about a third. They can resolve associated with early detection and actually associated with overall worse renal allograft function. So a reduction of one and a half mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared for every log increase in your class two donor specific antibody. What we went on to do again, together with Ram and JJ, who's now Nottingham, was to clinical stratify and actually look for uh, C1Q and C3D. So these are complement fixation of these antibodies. And again, what we showed is if you had donor specific antibodies, which um, were complement binding with C1Q, you can see statistically significant the survival of those kidneys went right down. And what we did is we had 215 patients, 75 of them had donor specific antibodies, 49% um, as you can see were C1Q positive, so about a half were C1Q positive and about a third were C3D positive. Very similarities between the various groups, there of course were some patients that had both complement fixation with C1Q and C3D. We looked at the differences between the overall groups to try and work out uh, which was more significant with which specific HLA type. And what we found is that if you looked at those with just C1Q, it didn't seem to discern. There was a slight worsening, but not a discernible. But actually, it was the C3D which actually was more discernible than the C1Q. And again, we looked to see the various uh, features of BAMF classification, look at tubulitis and vasculitis. So about two-fifths of the C1Q donor-specific antibodies did not show concomitant C3D fixing, but the C3D was definitely a better predictor of the renal allograft dysfunction. So let me touch on the newer area of non-HLA antibodies, and uh, Yelna Zainabunai have had a recent case where you've got biopsy-proven um, antibody-mediated rejection, and you don't have a whiff of anything. And we've now got panels um, together with Livy Shaw, who works in the Clinical Transplantation Laboratory here, where you can look. And sometimes you find, but sometimes you don't. So I think there's a lot more uh, that we need to know because post-transplant antibodies against non-HLA autoantigens are also associated with rejection and they reduce the overall outcome. But there, our knowledge is still lacking. We're still gaining information to be able to look at experimentally and clinically in patients what is happening and how do they develop acute and chronic antibody-mediated rejection. There are a lot of hypotheses. We like to blame the surgeons. You like this uh, Nikos there, surgical trauma. I don't know what you do to those kidneys that produces these non-HLA antibodies, but uh, physicians like to always say that it's a possibility. I'm more uh, etiopathogenesis, more with this hemic reperfusion injury and the alloimmune responses, which potentially involve soluble antigens, extracellular vesicles, or apoptotic bodies. But what we need to do is obviously understand a lot more about the identification of these very immunological phenotypes to see what non-HLA antibody-mediated rejection is and how we can improve the overall outcome for our children and indeed even adults post-kidney transplant as well. This is some of the autoantibodies that are there. And again, you can see
The interesting thing is that there's quite a few of them which again are complement dependent. That seems to be the same mode of causing renal allograft dysfunction by causing the inflammation within the allograft as the activation of the complement system, which has led very much to people saying, should we be using ecolizumab in these patients? But there is a lot of autoantibody and alloantibody responses to very uh, many of these. And there's also anti-endothelian receptor antibodies here um, that you can see. And the angiotensin type 2 receptor 1 antibody is, is very much being believed historically to be the most common non-HLA antibody. But we know that these intrarenal distribution of these receptors, for example, does vary according to the different parts of the kidney, which of course can then give different phenotypes histologically to the degree of inflammation that we have. Don't have time to go through all of this, but basically just talking about the interaction and the cross-reactivity that we see. At UCL, we very much have a T-cell immunology laboratory and a B-cell immunology, and they say never the twins shall meet, whereas I think there's a lot of crosstalk between T-cells and B-cells, which is important even in antibody-mediated response, which of course is more B-cell phenomenon. Lastly, prevention is better than a costly cure. But how do we do it? Well, I think the first thing to say is you need to avoid sensitizing events. You want to monitor your patients pre, peri and post transplantation and considering what screening that you're going to do for your individual patient. And then think about different parts of where you can act. And uh, for those of you who love this film, we do have the usual suspects. Claire talked about many of them. Um, but intravenous immunoglobulin, anti-CD20, and all of them have been looked at. Plasmapheresis, um, double filtration plasmapheresis, as well as plasma exchange, as well as immunoabsorption. Bertizumab, eculizumab, and daratumumab has also been talked about as well. And most of these are trying to reduce the antibodies, trying to remove the preformed antibodies and modulate the immune response. And I think that it does have to be done on an individual patient basis, but really we need good clinical trials. And we had one in the UK called Target, but unfortunately um, COVID-19 hit and that study never really got to the fruition. So we talked about earlier the B-cell depletion, the plasma cell depletion, the antibody depletion has all been important, just like in recurrence, and thinking about the inhibition of antibody function as well. Just very briefly, this is um, one study looking at the effect of giving intravenous immunoglobulin and rituximab. And I think uh, many places are potentially doing both when you've got renal allograft dysfunction, but sometimes even with plasma exchange, IVIG together with rituximab. So the problem is, is how low can you go with your immunosuppression because you're worried about the infectious complications? And then what do you do as soon as you get these donor specific antibodies? And uh, I think that we now are beginning to come full circle round where we're gone for minimising immunosuppression, but we're now seeing these antibodies form and now we're going back. And actually, sometimes I think about an individual patient and think, had we actually put, had you on steroids from the beginning, maybe your actual total burden of immunosuppression five years post-transplant may have been less had we not done a steroid minimisation protocol to start with. So I think uh, it works out very um, well uh, thinking an individual patient about what should we do and just to think about what do you do and this is a lot of Zainab's work that she's doing about when you've got chronic allograft dysfunction, you've got a failing graft, you've got these antibodies, how much immunosuppression do you give them because obviously there are advantages and disadvantages for continuing your immunosuppression. Don't forget about thinking about the failing allograft, what you're going to do with a patient, but actually taking them off immunosuppression may give a rebound and an increase in the breadth and number of antibodies, which may make retransplantation more difficult. So take home a message is to monitor HLA antibody, always question whether you should wean immunosuppression. And we debate with our colleagues about the risk of infection while on dialysis, whereas I think tacrolimus monotherapy probably doesn't have a huge impact, but can, uh, have a positive outcome in reducing your sensitization. Thank you very much. And just wanted to put a quick plug that together with Zainab and all the consultants at GOSH, if you want to remember to come to our nephrology course, it's going to be a hybrid um, Wednesday the 17th to Friday the 19th of April with the workshop for those people in London all day on the Wednesday, but the Thursday and Friday.
online. Thank you very much. So did you biopsy that patient? So I have to say that I, my threshold for biopsy goes down. Um, generally, I will augment the immunosuppression first if I think they're able to tolerate a higher dose of mycophenolate morphotol or if they're in low dose of um, um, tacrolimus, increase the target. I do that first. And then as soon as there's a whiff of renal allograft dysfunction or a concer concern, then we'll, we'll go for a biopsy. Or if your uh, MFI goes up, yeah, so I think if the MFI is increasing, yeah. I will counsel the family. Um, Yelena Zainab and I are all in the transplant team, together with Rachel and Dana, who was here yesterday ago. We talk a lot about this with families. I think the it depends how um, your risk status and how risk averse your parents are, but sometimes we've got some families that are very anti-biopsy. Um, so we've just got to try and balance it out with an individual. But yes, we have a lower threshold for doing a biopsy. Other questions? Thanks, Steve. Um, can I just ask, for patients with a failed transplant who have had a nephrectomy, what, do, do you stop immunosuppression? Because I've seen different things done in different centres. Um, I remember Chris Reed and the Evelina saying, absolutely, do not stop immunosuppression. Um, and in Glasgow, we've had a few that have... Uh, well, not, uh, who have moved on to adults, but they their immunosuppression. Yeah, stopped. so the so the the reason that people say don't is because there is the risk you have left some of the antigenic material within, such as the ureter, and you could still form. I think if you've done an nephrectomy and you you don't have donor specific antibodies HLA, you can monitor and we wean off. If I'm going to be honest, the problem is is you generally forget to repeat the HLA antibodies if they're on dialysis and you don't have a transplant plan. So I think it's important to, to keep going with the monitoring.